。如果问这个时代最伟大的物理学家是谁，他一定榜上有名。霍金曾在他的启发下，完成了巨著《时间简史》。应对粒子物理标准模型的决定性贡献，他早在1979年就荣膺诺贝尔奖。不仅如此，他还是目前最受认可的早期宇宙理论——爆炸理论的重要贡献者，向世人描绘了完全可信的宇宙起源图。从微观粒子到宏观宇宙，他穷极一生寻找宇宙终极命题的答案。Let's welcome Professor Steven Weinberg. 
in the strong forces and that make up the neutrons and protons. These are particles called quarks. Uh, a neutron or a proton is made of three quarks of different types. This theory of quarks and ch charged particles like the electron and neutrinos uh, and 12 kinds of force field really was very much like quantum electrodynamics. You could almost be confused about which theory you were looking at if you didn't know how many fields and types of matter particles there were. What kept us from seeing this so easily when we first started to work on this in the 1950s, there were obstacles to our understanding. One of the obstacles was something called symmetry breaking. The equations of the standard model turned out to have a great degree of simplicity that was lost in the solutions of the equations which govern the actual phenomena. And it took some sleuthing to figure that out. There was also another phenomenon known as color trapping. The quarks Inter have a quantity, carry a quantity like electric charge, which we call color. It's not a very good name, but that's what we call it. Um, the difference between it and electric charge is that when you pull two charged particles apart, even if they attract each other, the attraction gets weaker and weaker as they go to greater and greater distances inversely proportional to the distance. Whereas if you take two quarks and try to pull them apart, the force gets stronger and stronger as you pull them apart so that you can never isolate quarks. We, we've never seen a track of a quark in our detectors. They, in principle, cannot be isolated. We believe in them because of the theories that are based on them. The theories that say, for instance, that neutrons and protons each consist of three quarks work. And in, in that sense, we know that quarks are real. So the standard model, once these problems were understood, the problem of symmetry breaking and the problem of color trapping, once these obstacles were overcome. Uh, the theory was in good shape by the 1970s and in the 1980s it was confirmed by a variety of experiments that detected new particles predicted by these theories. Uh, and uh, the standard model became a standard piece of textbook physics. But what, so why aren't we happy with it? Why do we find ourselves dissatisfied? Why do we go to governments and say we need to build larger accelerators and do, to do experiments that will take us beyond the standard model? Well, for several reasons. One is the standard model itself has a number of numerical constants that have to be specified in order to use the theory to make predictions. For example, in addition to the charge of the electron, there are two other quantities that are like electric charges uh, that have to be taken from experiment. In addition to the mass of the electron, we need the masses of all the other charged particles similar to the electron and the quarks. Altogether, about nine masses have to be specified in the theory, taken from experiment. Well, you might say, what's so bad about that? After all, uh, when Newton uh, developed his theory of the solar system, he had to take the radii of the different planetary orbits from observation. Uh, you can't get everything by pure theory. Uh, that's just the way the world is. But there's a difference. 
the solar system is a result of accidents, the accidents in which the planets were formed at various distances from the sun. We don't think the standard model is an accident. We think that the numerical quantities in it represent something very deep about the universe, but we can't figure out what it is. We look at these numerical values of masses and charges, and they seem to have a message that we can't read. That's one of the things that bothers us. Another is not just the fact that we don't know where these numbers come from, but that some of them seem very strange. The ratios of the masses, well, they're numbers like 10 or 100, or we can live with that. Or we can imagine that coming out of some kind of calculation. The ratios of the charges, the Remember, I said there are four, there are altogether three charges that you need to describe the weak and electromagnetic forces. Those ratios are like factors of one or ten. Or, they're not very different from one. We can imagine that coming out of some kind of future calculation. We don't, we can't do the calculation now. But there are other ratios that are really weird. The scale of the masses of all the masses of all the particles in the standard model, electrons, quarks, force carrying particles, whatever you wish, they're all determined by a single mass parameter that has to be put in by hand. It, it's, a, it's the value of a certain field that pervades the universe. It has a value about 250 times the energy it, the, well, the mass of the proton, say, the mass of the nucleus of hydrogen. We don't know why that, but 250 is not a remarkable number. But we know other numbers that describe nature that are very, very different. One of them is the force that has so far been left out of the standard model, the force of gravity. Gravity is weak because we do observations at very low energy. There is an, a mass scale at which particles with that mass would attract each other as strongly as the strong forces in a nucleus. That mass scale is called the Planck scale after Max Planck, who first introduced it in 1900. It's about 16 orders of magnitude larger than the mass scale that I mentioned of the standard model. That is a one with 16 zeros after it. A huge number, where does that number come from? There's another scale, which is also enormous. Remember I mentioned that the strengths of the weak and strong and electromagnetic interactions are governed by three quantities that are like electric charge that play the role of electric charge in the weak and strong and electromagnetic forces. These three are quite different in size. They differ by, oh, the strong one is like 100 times the, the others. But they depend on energy very, very slowly. If you project them upward in energy, you see that they converge. And they all come together at an energy which is not that different from the Planck scale. It's maybe a factor of 10 or 100 times lower. So there is a mystery of scale in the universe. There are fundamental forces, at, including gravity, at one scale, and all the other forces of nature that we study in the standard model at a scale which is, oh, 16 or 14 orders of magnitude smaller. We're, we call this the hierarchy problem. Where does this hierarchy of scales come from? And it's worse than that. Because if we look in the other direction, toward very small energy scales, there's, there's another scale we don't understand. We know that empty space 
has a certain energy per volume. It's very, very small, but there's a lot of space in the universe. This energy affects the gravitational field of the universe, which affects the way the universe is expanding. And as discovered in 1998, is causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. Now, we can make an estimate of the energy scale that produces the observed acceleration of the expansion of the universe. And it is about 16 or so orders of magnitude smaller than the energy scales of the standard model. Another strange, huge number. Where does it come from? We don't know. So, let me end this with a happy thought. We, in the 1950s, when I was a graduate student, envied the success that our predecessors made in developing quantum electrodynamics. And then my generation of theoretical physicists were able to develop the standard model and extend that success to all the other forces of nature and all the other particles that we observe in our laboratories with the exclusion of gravity. We're not done. The standard model of which we're, we are, I think, justly proud is not the final answer. You, the younger generation of theoretical physicists, have your work cut out for you to explain these enormous, mysterious numbers that relate different phenomena of nature. Good luck with that. <laughs>